In this video, we're going to go over Bernoulli's equation. Bernoulli's equation is an equation that is used to describe ideal fluid flow. Now, the first thing you need to know is that there are several requirements for fluid flow to be considered ideal. The first is that the fluid must be incompressible. Now, if a fluid is incompressible, that means that number one, the density of the fluid is constant. And number two, the flow is continuous. If you recall in our video with the continuity equation, if you have an incompressible fluid moving through a pipe, then the amount of fluid that enters the pipe is the amount of fluid that exits the pipe. And the flow rate is also the same at both points. So these two we've discussed before. Next, the fluid flow has to be laminar. So that means there cannot be any turbulence. And number three, there has to be no or negligible viscosity. And since viscosity is the result of intermolecular forces, essentially this is saying there are no IMFs. So in this way, it's very similar to ideal gases, where ideal gases also do not have intermolecular forces. Okay, so if you have these three requirements fulfilled, then you can apply Bernoulli's equation. Bernoulli's equation, you should know, is derived from conservation of energy. So when we look at this equation here, we can see a number of similarities. So first of all, we can see there are uh, pressure terms. So these terms right here, this is pressure. Um, and then we have this term over here, one half rho v squared. This should remind you of an equation you've used many times, one half mv squared for kinetic energy. And finally, this last term also should be familiar to you, rho gh. This is very similar to mgh that we use for potential energy. So essentially, you can see how this is essentially conservation of energy, but now applied to fluids undergoing ideal fluid flow. Now, there are many applications of Bernoulli's equation. So for the remainder of this video and also in the next video, we're going to look at examples applying Bernoulli's equation. So in the first situation, we have this question of where is pressure greater? And we're going to be looking at this tube here. For this tube, the fluid is going to be flowing from left to right. So over here, where the cross-sectional area is large, we're going to call this point one. And then the fluid then is going to squeeze through the smaller opening where we have point two. So we want to know where is pressure greater? Is pressure greater at point one or is the pressure greater at point two? Now the first thing you should know is when you're looking at Bernoulli's equation, it has a lot of terms, three terms on the left, three terms on the right. Often on the MCAT, you're gonna be working with situations where one of these three terms is going to be equal on both sides, so you can exclude them. In this case, what is the same on both sides is actually the height, that H1, is equal to h2. And we can see this when we go ahead and draw in the heights. So height is measured from the bottom. So these in red that I'm drawing here, this is h1 and h2. So we can see how the height is the same at these two points. And when that's the case, we can exclude the rho gh term from Bernoulli's equation since they're equal on both sides. So that leaves us with Bernoulli's equation, P1 plus 1 half rho v1 squared equals P2 plus 1 half rho v2 squared. So to compare the pressure, that means it's going to depend on the flow speed at these two points. And the flow speed actually is going to depend on the cross-sectional area. Since continuity holds, the flow rate entering the pipe has to equal the flow rate exiting the pipe. And if you recall from the continuity equation, A1V1 equals A2V2. And in this situation, since the cross-sectional area at point one, A1, is greater than the cross-sectional area at point two, this means that the flow speed is less at point one than at point two. 
And this should make sense to you because if you have a large cross-sectional area and you're going to a smaller cross-sectional area, now you have to still maintain the amount of, same amount of fluid entering as the amount of fluid exiting. So in order to achieve the same flow rates, the fluid must be moving faster where you have a smaller cross-sectional area. Now, knowing the difference in flow speeds at point one and two, we can go ahead and extend this back to our Bernoulli's equation. What you can see is if V1 is less than V2, that means that the pressure at point one is greater than the pressure at point two. So the answer here is point one. That is where pressure is greater. Now here, you need to be a little careful because a lot of students, this isn't intuitive for them. They would look at this and think, hey, when you have fluid moving at a large cross-sectional area and now you're squeezing it through a smaller cross-sectional area, they would think that there is greater pressure here. However, that is not the case. So this is very important for you to keep in mind that in general, faster flowing fluids are under lower pressure. And the opposite is slower flowing fluids are under higher pressure. And what I'm describing here is actually what is called the Bernoulli effect. Faster flowing fluids are under lower pressure, slower flowing fluids are under higher pressure. Okay. So knowing this, let's take a look at a Venturi effect. The Venturi effect is actually the similar situation except set up in a tube as to actually uh, take advantage of the pressure differences. So in the situation, you usually have a tube where the cross-sectional area is larger on the two sides and in the center, the cross-sectional area is smaller. And there is also usually some container that is holding fluid. So in this case, we're going to say that we have fluid that is moving from left to right. And we have points one, two, and three. Now, in this case, some information, the cross-sectional area at point one is the same as the cross-sectional area at point three. So these two sides are equivalent. So instead of talking about one and three, I can just really talk about one versus two, and that tells us the same relationship between two and three. So as we can see, the cross-sectional area at point one is greater than the cross-sectional area at point two. From what we just discussed from continuity equation, that means the flow speed at point one is less than the flow speed at point two. So throughout this pipe, the fluid is moving fastest at the center at point two. And since faster flowing fluids are under a lower pressure, that means the pressure at point two is less than the pressure at point one and three. The consequence of this is that this actually generates a vacuum at the center of the tube. So a vacuum, right, a, a drop in the pressure is produced at the center of the tube. Now what the vacuum is actually important for is if you have a vacuum and connected you have some fluid and this fluid has some vapor particles the vapor particles will actually be drawn towards that vacuum. And as these vapor particles get drawn up, they're actually going to get pushed through the pipe. So this is actually a very clever way for you to actually be able to mix a gas with a fluid. And a common example of this is actually with carburetors. So if you take a look at this diagram, you can see how there's a pipe where in the middle, the cross-sectional area decreases. Where you have that decrease in cross section area, you have a vacuum, and that vacuum can be used to draw in fuel, and the fuel can then be pushed through the pipe through the rest of the engine to drive combustion. So the Venturi effect, this is something you definitely want to be familiar with for the MCAT.